The book of Colossians we're going to be reading from this morning. Colossians <coughs> chapter 3. You didn't want to say just thank you so much for all the love that you've shown the folks over the last week. Uh, my heart has been blessed. Uh, it's a hard week, uh, but my heart's been blessed. Uh, I've just seen the Lord's people love one another. And I'll tell you, uh, I don't know what my mind's going to be like in another 10 years, or another 30 years, or another 40 years. It's not real good shape now. But I think as long as I'm able to retain any, any sense of sanity, I'll never forget watching Connor Jackson play that song and sing in honor of his Lord and his daddy. Amen. I told him that was one of them. And just, in my world, one of the greatest things I've ever seen anybody do. And, uh, uh, just made me proud. Made me proud of him. Made me proud of my Lord. Strengthened me the way he did. Continue to pray for them. Colossians chapter 3. I want to start reading in verse 5. And thinking about the thought of this morning of not us. Not us. You know, there are a lot of bad things going on in this world. Some unimaginable <coughs> things. The open embrace of sin has become mind-blowing. Uh, and we think about, you know, the abortion law in New York, and I'm sitting there holding a little six-pound baby. It was just a, a little early, not, not a premature baby, but, you know, maybe, maybe a week or so before his due date. And I'm sitting there holding that baby yesterday. And in New York, they can legally kill that baby. Yet. It's like... What in the world is going on in the mind of human beings that they become that vile and that filthy? My sister told me about down in Lafayette, they had a drag queen come read for the children at the public library. Lafayette, Louisiana. It's not just in New York and California, folks. So we went to Paris for you know. And you're sitting there thinking, what in the world is going on? But you know, it's so easy to look outside the walls at the filth and the ungodliness and, and just get all up in an uproar and, and get fired up about sin and the ungodliness in our land. And we ought to. I don't want to minimize how offended we ought to be. But you know, there ought, to, there ought to be some things that we as Lord's people are willing to stand up and say, not me. Now this is not a declaration of being sinless. Okay? But I'm going to tell you, unless I somehow become damaged, I can't imagine in a million years how in the world I could ever have any part in killing a baby inside a mother's womb. Knowingly, intentionally, that is the objective. In a million years, I can't even begin to imagine what is going on in the mind of a man that's like another man. And those things that are just filthy and ungodly. You know, there are some things in this world that we ought to be able, as the Lord's people, to stand up and say, not me. Not me. But well, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. You know how many people, you know how many of God's people run back into the doghouse when somebody reads that verse? In other words, what we'll do is when sin is brought into our yard, we'll run out of our doghouse and we'll just bark at it, bark 
at it, and I mean, we'll just try to tear it up. But then somebody pulls out a pocket and says, well, let me help you without seeing it. Catch the first stone. And we tuck our tail, we run back in our doghouse, and we cower down. Has there ever been a sinful man make that statement that was acceptable by God? <laughs> Who made that statement? The sinless one made that statement. You see, if, if, if we were never to stand against sin, then I have to sit down. Because part of my job is the pastor in feeding the flock of God is to preach the whole counsel of God. And the Bible tells us that the Word of God it does what to us? It just, boy, it just rubs us and it soothes us. Uh, no, the Bible says the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And it pierces asunder. And it divides the intents of the heart. And it divides the soul and the spirit. In other words, it's, it's offensive. It pierces and it cuts us. And so if we're never to throw a rock, well then I guess I could never preach against sin. And I just have to preach like TV preachers and stand up and every Sunday tell you how much God loves you. God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. God loves you. But you see, the Bible, the Bible is chunking some rocks. These are not rocks by my design. These are not projectiles that I have invented. The Bible, friend, stands for the Word of God. Stand up and declare, thus saith the Lord. And when they say, well, let he who's without sin cast the first stone, let them know real quick, I'm not throwing rocks at you. God's chunking boulders. <laughs> this is the Word of God that has told us what is right and wrong. Yeah. It's not my idea. There ought to be some things in this world that we as God's people say, not us. Read with me Colossians chapter 3 and verse 5. The encouragement here is, be, is if you're risen with Christ, if you are saved, that we set our affection on things above. In verse 5. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Into which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them. But now ye also put off all these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds. And have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Do I have any saved people here this morning? Amen. Amen. I think there was 11. 11 saved people. Well, I'm going to preach to you 11 for a little bit. Then we'll get the rest of them. If you are saved, you are supposed to be a new creature. A new man. I know we wish that it were possible that the old man, the old sin nature would just die and not be an issue anymore. But you see, that old man, that sin nature is actually housed inside your physical body. In your flesh. That's why it's sometimes referred to as the flesh, worth against the spirit. And so that flesh that we have, that we are housed in right now, it is sinful, and because of sin, it is condemned to die. And so if the Lord doesn't come back first, we're all going to die. No way around that. And then the Bible says, and after death, the judgment. In this body, we struggle. I struggle. I really can't, like, technically speak on behalf of anybody else because I don't know about your struggle. I don't know what your struggle is with. I don't know where your strengths or your weaknesses are inside of you. But I know you struggle. I struggle. Paul struggled. So in this struggle... <coughs> There ought to be some things that the Bible uses 
used this phrase, we ought to mortify in verse 5. And that word mortify, when we think of, uh, when we talk about mortify, I was mortified when I heard something. Uh, but that actually does kind of correlate with another term we use. You ever heard somebody say, I was scared to death? Have you ever been scared to death? And you came back? <laughs> yeah. But it actually, it actually all ends up going back to this word that the Bible uses here, which is mortify, which means to be dead, or to dead. Okay? So what God is telling us is we need to kill some things. Woo! We hunters like that. I mean, there's just something in the male constitution that likes to kill things. Now, I know you ladies think we are just cruel and unreasonable, but I'm telling you, you put a BB gun in the hand of a 12-year-old boy, and you think he's just going to go shoot cans? It's not happening. That's it, Miss Davis. Those sweet, innocent birds that land in your yard are now targets. And I remember the first bird I ever killed. That's from North Carolina. How do my grandma's out there? I don't, I, I don't, I don't remember whose BB gun it was. It may have been mine. Of course, I grew up in the city in a neighborhood, and so, you know, houses from here to here carry BB guns. Yeah, probably wasn't a good recipe, but anyway, I had one up there. And I could tell I could take you to the portion of fence on the side of my grandma's house where that bird was sitting, and then I shot it. My first cue. And I walked up and saw the little bird. I would love to tell you it was a quick and painless, but it wasn't quite like that. So I walked up. Found out I was human. I had a little bit of feelings. Just a little bit. It didn't last long. But I kind of felt bad for just a second. Then I saw another bird and shot it. So <laughs> <laughs> There's just something in the mail. I love ladies, I'm sorry, I, I don't know how y'all think. I, I don't understand. But in the mail, just something wants to. You put a gun in his hand, he wants to shoot it. He wants to kill something. I'm telling you, I don't know how many times I had struggled. I'm talking about serious struggle. Not just when I was 18. I should say, how many times I do still seriously struggle when I'm sitting in the deer stand. And the deer aren't moving, and I see a crow, or I see a squirrel, or I see a coon. You understand, if you shoot a squirrel with a 308, <laughs> you're not killing the squirrel to eat the squirrel. There's not going to be anything left. But I'm sitting here looking at it through the scope thinking, oh, oh my goodness. And I noticed some of y'all, we're, we're heartless and cruel and everything else, okay? Uh, so be it, that's what we are. But I want you to know, you know the Bible tells us we need to kill some things. We need to mortify. We need to cut off. These things should not be alive inside of our lives. What are they? Here's the list. First off, fornication. Fornication. Fornication means exactly what you think fornication means, but maybe even a little bit broader than you think it means. Read the definition in your, in your uh, little insert there. And it talks about illicit sexual intercourse, adultery, fornication, homosexuality, lesbianism. And then it goes on and on and talks about unimaginable things, but all under this umbrella of fornication. Child of God, listen to me. Same person, it ought not be in your life. Amen. Uncleanness, impurity, physically or morally, just generally means uncleanness, but in the Sense of spiritual things, lustful, luxurious, wild, extravagant, nasty life should be God's people. Inordinate affection, passion, affection, lust. In other words, something inside of you that just moves you in a way that causes you to be depraved and vile. I want to tell you something. These people who do these unimaginable acts in our society, they didn't wake up today 
and was the first time they've ever had this thought. These are things that are going on inside of them and thoughts that are unimaginable that are brewing inside of their minds. And they ponder them and they wonder about them. Maybe they even battle them sometimes. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you what they never did. They never killed them. They never killed those thoughts. They never killed those desires. Because when you kill the desire, you don't commit the act. These things should not be the life of saved people. Concupiscence. Desire, lust, and craving for what is forbidden. You say, well, what's, what, what does that mean, what's forbidden? Who's to say what I can and can't do? This is really a kind of a simple thing to me. <coughs> Does anybody know where in the scriptures the list is of all of the things that the Lord's people are allowed to do? Does anybody know where that's at? In other words, the, the, in the Bible where it says you can spend time with friends, spend time with family, go fishing, go hunting, play baseball, uh, go run the nets. Uh, uh, I mean, where, does anybody know in the Bible where this list is of all of the things that you are allowed to do? It's not in there. You ever wondered why? It's too long. That's it, Brother Frank. As a matter of fact, when, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, did the Lord list all the trees they could eat of? He said, how? You may eat of all of the trees of the garden except one. You see, what Satan has done a masterful job of is convincing us that there are not many things. The list of things we can do to enjoy life is very small. But the list of things that are really fun and we want to do are all forbidden. And so we're drawn to the, to the forbidden. We're drawn to those things that the Bible tells us we ought to stay away from. Friend, I want you to know just as Adam and Eve had a direct command from the Lord to stay away from that which, which was forbidden, we too have a command from the Lord to cut off those desires inside of us to stay away from those things that are forbidden. He goes on and talks about covetousness. I, I, we really, in my opinion, abuse the word covetous or covet. To the point that it really doesn't have the impactful meaning that I think it's supposed to have. Matter of fact, this is one of those Ten Commandments, wasn't it? So, so I don't mean this disrespectfully, but just so you'll understand, this makes it a big deal. Okay? And so we think covet, we think, well, if I want a new boat, I'm just covet. Well, how are you talking about getting this boat? Well, I've been saving my money, and so I've, you know, I've got the money set aside. And but I just feel like if I want it, I'm coveting. But that's not coveting. Okay? No, 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 no. When David looked over the edge of that wall, when he was up on his roof, and he saw Bathsheba, he said, hmm. And I don't know. I don't know for what he might have already known who she was or what her marital status was or anything else. Or maybe he had to call one of his servants to come over and say, hey, who, who is that? Say, well, that's Bathsheba. Say, is she married? Yeah. But you know, he wanted something so bad that he was willing to do whatever it took to get her. Yeah. We all know what David did. He had her husband murdered so he could have that's coveting. And you say, oh, okay. So you have to murder to covet. No, no, no. You don't have to murder to covet, but here's what it means. That you are willing through the acts of fraud or extortion, that you are willing to do whatever it takes to get what you want. That's coveting. And you say, well, I really don't have a problem with that. But I think we do sometimes. We're just not thinking. 
In other words, I want to live this particular life so badly that I'm willing to sacrifice my family to do it. I'm willing to destroy my marriage, I'm willing to destroy my relationship with my children, my influence with them, so I can go have this. How many people have sacrificed their families for something they covered? Career, fame, money. Huh? How of God, can I just tell you something? You're going to be a whole lot happier broke you listen to me? Sitting in a little, I mean, run down shack of a house. Eating peanut butter and crackers. But got your wife by your side who loves you with all her heart. And got your children sitting at your feet that love you and love your mom. They love your wife. You're going to be a whole lot happier there than you are chasing. Okay? Chasing something that you're equating to happiness. And then one day, mark my word, one day in your future, your heart is going to be ripped out because you're on your 15th marriage your kids don't want anything to do with you. You say, oh, my kids will never be that way. Friend, I'm going to tell you something. You sell your kids out and see how much they love you when you get older. Yeah. I've been doing this for a while. I've seen a few things. You sell your kids out so you can chase whatever it is that you're imagining or you're dreaming. You sell your kids out. And watch how much they're going to love you in your old age. It's not going to happen. You see, in our minds, we think all of these things are natural. And well, if I want it, I deserve it. Says who? Let me tell you the one thing you deserve. Hell. Yeah. That's what you deserve. <clears throat> and we get covetous in this life. And we think we deserve. And we look down the road and say, well, how come he gets a new boat? Or how come she gets a new car? How come I... Quit worrying about everybody else. Amen. If you will be honest with yourself, close yourself up in your home, and look around the fact that you've got furniture, you got a bed to lay on and a couch to sit on. My goodness, most of us got a recliner. You understand, that's kind of spoiled right there, isn't it? Chicken to feed up, I mean. And we got food in the pantry. We're warm, or we're cool, or I mean, we're blessed, and we're blessed, and we're blessed. There's no way you can ever look around at your life and see the blessings that God has given you and be covetous at the same time. But you look out your window, it's what somebody else has got or what the world is offering you, and you'll get covetous every time. That shouldn't be the Lord's people. Paul said, contentment with God is great day. In verse 6, for which things say, I want you, listen, everybody here, this is simple, simple. I want everybody here to read Colossians chapter 3 and verse 6. In your Bible, open it up. For which things say, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. These things that were just listed, they make God angry. They anger God. And God's anger comes out of Him against children of disobedience. The heathen of this world. The heathen of this world are getting busted upside the chops by God left and right and left and right. Why? Because of this heathen living. God's not appointed unto us a day of wrath. God doesn't want to take his belt off and whoop you. I mean, listen, if you're a... Am I good? I'm just going to 
uh, make a very, I think, safe assumption here. You never woke up as a parent and said, I hope I get to whoop that sucker any day. Oh, I tell you. Hey, nothing, nothing brings me more joy than laying the ladder to the backside of big wheels. I hope he stumbles. I hope he crosses the line. I hope he disobeys. And I, I tell you what, if he doesn't do it, all this little brother does. Just give me somebody to pull. Child of God, listen to me. That's not the mind of God. God doesn't want to, but let me tell you something. God will in a heartbeat. These things should not be in the lives of us as God's people. He said, In which ye also walked past him sometime when you lived in them. First, verse 8, quickly. But now, he also put off these things. I want you to notice there's a little bit different wording here, and it's worded differently for a reason. That previous list that started in verse 5, we were told to mortify, right? Kill these things. Right? Kill them, kill them, kill them. You understand, when you kill something, it doesn't jump back up and come back to life. Right? Okay, then those things that were listed, they need to be killed. Done away with no longer a part of our lives. But now we're fixing to start in, into a list, but let me tell you, the Bible doesn't say to kill them. It says to put them off. But the reason the Bible doesn't say to kill them is because they're not easily killed. These are things that... You take off and it wants to jump back on you. And you take off and it wants to jump back on you. The other things is kill them. In other words, uh -uh, no, no. They shouldn't even be a part of your life. But here we're going to be told to take these things off of us. But the problem is some of it, sometimes these things are our struggles. <coughs> They're things that jump back on us. But take them off. What are we going to take off? Anger. Anybody here got an anger problem? No. You're liars. Yeah, I'm kidding. Me too. Yeah, got an anger problem? Yeah, you got an anger problem. Huh? Get mad at your spouse? Unfairly? Hey, Valentine's Day is still affecting y'all. Y'all are still up or something. Anger! Wrath! Okay? This is a fierce indignation. Blasphemy. You say, oh, I'm not guilty of blasphemy. I've never been guilty of blasphemy. You know, every time we think blasphemy, we think blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Blasphemy itself is what? To speak ill against someone with intent to injure or to destroy their name or their testimony. Huh? In other words, not speaking against them in a general conversation, but the intent is to tear that good for nothing rascal down. Malice, I skipped over malice. Malice is just being mean, depraved, ill will, filthy communication. Y'all ready? Vile conversation, foul speaking. Low and obscene speech. Child of God, put your nasty talking. Hear me? Quit. I don't know what it is that somehow we equate nasty talk to being tough or something like that. The toughest man on the face of this earth never said one nasty word. Ain't none of you could have Well, I mean, exactly what do you think nasty talk is doing for you? Huh? Just really showing somebody how angry you are? Can I offer you an alternative opinion? Nasty talk is really just a revelation of your ignorance and your limited vocabulary. Since you lack the ability to express yourself without nasty words, you use nasty words so you think somebody can understand how aggravated, frustrated, angry you are. And so you pick up the nasty words. Why not just expand your vocabulary and leave the nasty words out? And start learning some new adjectives that can better express and emphasize how frustrated you are. They can just go in a, listen, as a matter of fact, 
if, you, if you're not into vocabulary and thesauruses and dictionaries and all of that kind of stuff, and don't want to expand your vocabulary, at least just go in the bathroom and practice your math face. That way you don't have to say a word. <coughs> just look at them. But do you understand? I'm, listen, some of y'all may get angry at me, but I got one shot. I'm going to take it while I got it, okay? Do you know how many times? And I'm talking. So your mind will be in the right place. <coughs> And you're going to think about somebody over here or somebody over there. People in this room right now, you have injured and damaged my ability to minister in this community. There you go. Okay? Because I run into people who know you, and then they tell me about how filthy you are. And then I'm standing there like a humiliated parent. What am I supposed to say? Jesus still loves you. I'm sorry, a church, I'm sorry my church member acted like a heathen in front of you. I'm sorry my church member cussed you out. I'm sorry my church member stole from you. I'm sorry my church member did this. I'm sorry. That's all I can say. Do you, do you understand? I, I know y'all pay me. I'm supposed to make the church grow. I'm supposed to be able to go out here in the community and just win everybody to Jesus and everybody follow me and just come flood the church. And, 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 it, and I'm not going to tell you it's a regular occasion, okay? But I'll tell you this. I've been here 14 years, and it's happened snapping several times. The people that I've met in the community that have been real quick to ask, well, doesn't so-and-so go down there? And I said, well, yes, she does. Or yes, she does. And I'll tell you what, that sucker cussed me one time. Oh. I want to I bury my head with sand. You know, Preacher, you've never done anything wrong. <laughs> Listen, I've already had to be abused by this sermon that you're trying. <laughs> My point is this. These are things the Bible tells us, not us. You hear me? Not us. Uh, no. He said, Where are you, are you talking about living a sinless life? My goodness, this is not a sinless life. This is just a decent life. This is just a decent life. God's people ought to be living decent lives. We're wondering how come folks don't want to be saved. Well, if you're the Bible they're reading, maybe you're the problem. Can I say it any plainer? Why would anybody want your Jesus if your life looks like it does? Does that make sense to you? Listen to me, it doesn't work. It doesn't work, it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Me running around telling them, oh, let me tell you, Fords, Fords, Fords. Buy Ford, buy Ford, buy Ford. Don't ever break buy a Ford. Don't look at my driveway, I've got three four yards. Huh? Oh, Jesus is good, Jesus is good, Jesus is good. You know, you want to go fishing Sunday? Yeah. It ain't working. Huh? You want to go home and talk Friday night? Yeah. Want to come hang out and say some loving words? Yeah. It doesn't work. So here's what I'm telling you. Your friends, your loved ones, your neighbors, your kids, everybody around you is not getting a true, beautiful image of Jesus. None of us are perfect, but are you even trying? And somewhere down the road, your heart's going to break because you're not saved. It's going to happen somewhere down the road. They're going to come to me and want me to go talk to them. Because you painted an ugly picture of Jesus in front of them. You see, when the Bible says, get rid of these things, take these things off of you. It's because we should have put on a new man. <coughs> God help us to be a people that need that we need to know this. <coughs> we just buried a man 54 years old. Everyone 55 years, 54 years old. Okay? Let me tell you, I don't like that. But it reinforces me, and it reinforces in me every day the brevity of life. That I don't know. I don't know when that guy that I've been talking to or when that lady I've met or I don't know when. It's going to be their time. The time is short. No matter how long you think you've got, the time is short. The Bible tells us to redeem the time. Take advantage of what we've got. Listen, you ain't got to you ain't got to put on your Jesus pipe it on yourself and go walk up and down the street. You ain't got to stand on the street corner and hold some billboard and, and make some foolish clown out of yourself, okay? But simply in your life, listen, listen. Take this mess off. 
Get it out of your life. You say, well, it's a struggle. Oh, no, no, listen, I do understand that. It is a struggle. But then get up tomorrow and struggle again to get this mess out of your life. Why? Because somebody in your life needs to be saved. Somebody in your life needs to see Jesus. Somebody in your life, maybe the person that I come to five years from now and try to talk to them about the Lord, but because they've got such a corrupt idea in view and some, such a, a messed up perception of church people because you in your life, that I'm never even really able to plant a seed. This is bigger than me. And it's bigger than you. And if you go on and read a few verses, you start talking about this, what's going on here has nothing to do with being rich or being poor or being a Greek or being a Jew. It has nothing to do with all of that. It's all about one human being living right for the Lord because another human being needs the Lord. I want to ask you today, you got any friends or family members that, are so, that need to be saved? Huh? You got any that need to be in church? You got any that need to follow the Lord in scriptural baptism? I'm going to tell you what you need to do to begin with. Get yourself right. Okay? He said, well, I need to talk to them. Let me tell you something. Get yourself right. Fix yourself. You say, well, I can't. No, you don't want to. God help us today as saved people to have an earnest desire. Somehow, God, somehow, help me be more like Jesus. My people see the love of God shed abroad in my heart. Help me be more like Jesus. Lost person, I want you to know something today. And I'm going to close with this thought. Brother Greg, let's have a human invitation. Please, please, please understand. I am not the Lord. I am not perfect and I am not sinless. I never claim to be. And I need to be better than I am. But if you think you're going to be able to hide behind me at the day of judgment, in other words, well, I would have got saved if Wilkes was nicer. Or I would have got saved if Wilkes was sweeter. Or I would have got saved if Wilkes had not said an ugly word. Okay? If you think you're going to be able to hide behind that, you are foolish. Jesus died for you. And he loves you. And if you've come to that realization in your heart today that you need to be saved, you're without excuse. It doesn't matter what I've done or what I haven't done. It doesn't matter what your mama did, your daddy did, your best friend, your brother, or your sister. You're accountable before God. Jesus died for you and he loves you and he'll save you today. No excuses. But nothing to do with me or your upbringing. Calvary was about you. Say, person, let me tell you this. We can't undo what we've done. But we sure ought to be able to control what we're fixing to do. There's some things that we need to kill in our lives. Some things we need to put on. People need Jesus. Our community needs the Lord. Our state needs the Lord. God only knows our country needs the Lord. They need to see Jesus Christ. Might they see Him for us? Stand with me, our Heavenly Father. If there's anybody here who's never said to Jesus, I pray that today will be the day. For those who are saved, Father, we know, you know, you fully understand it's a struggle. But Father, I pray today that we'll make the commitment within our hearts to put off these things that are detrimental to our testimony for you. That we'll put on that new man and we'll just live a life that's placing our will. Save the lost. Use us as a testimony. These things I pray in Jesus.